Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to Answers for May 26, 2020. I'm Kevin Daly. Today on Answers, there will be a school update. There will be a school at home update with Audra Talbot. My guest today is Joyce Rio, who is the Assistant Director of Therapies at the Capital Region Education Council, CREC. And of course, there will be time for Q&A from participants. Please get ready to tap that Q&A button and don't wait until the end. If you think of a question, send it to us right away. We want to hear from you. Answers is brought to you by PATH Parent to Parent Family Voices of Connecticut, a nonprofit organization that for over 30 years has served families of children with special health care needs. Here in front of you, you see a partial list of PATH programs and services. I would like to focus on just one of them, <coughs> the <coughs> CT CASA program. This program is a youth leadership program. It's for young people, youth and young adults, ages 13 through 26. They meet monthly. These days they meet virtually in, in video uh, in a video meeting. There was a time when they met in person and there will be a time when they meet in person again. This group is self-governing. They elect their own leaders. They pick their own projects that they want to take on, such as three years ago when CASA planned a statewide uh, summit for young people going through transition. And CASA is a safe place. There's no room for bullying at CASA. There's no room for social pressures. Frankly, there's so much work to do to keep the young people occupied. There's no room for that kind of nonsense. Youth of all abilities are welcome at CASA. Parents are welcome at CASA too. However, parents play a lesser role, <coughs> excuse me, a lesser role than the participants. It's all about the participants. Parents are welcome to stay at the meetings, to observe from the side. Many parents choose to drop off their children at CASA meetings. It's up to the parent, it's up to the family. For more information about CT CASA, please go to the PATH website and you see the website address in front of you. That's also a good way to find out more about PATH. If you have any questions about this webinar, please contact me directly, Kevin Daly, at the email address you see in front of you. While you're online, please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and watch us on YouTube, where we ask you to like and subscribe. Here comes the fine print, folks. This webinar is not legal advice. It's not intended to be healthcare advice. It's not intended to be advice of any kind. This is a webinar about looking for answers at a time when there are more questions than answers. And this webinar and any attached materials are the sole property of PATH and are not to be used for any other purpose without the express written permission of PATH. Here's the school update for May 26th. Currently, public schools remain closed in 48 states for the rest of the academic year, or it's being recommended. Only Montana and Wyoming are allowing school districts to open. In these states, the decision is made by local school districts. While most school districts in these states remain closed for the year, a small number of school districts opened in just the last two weeks. Meanwhile, in Connecticut, schools continue to be closed for the rest of the year. Distance learning is in progress. And summer break is rearing its ugly head. It will be here before you know it. And that's why it was timely for the State Department of Education to read it, release its guidance last week, guidance on extended school year programs for special education students. Now, I, I want to eliminate, eliminate any possible confusion. I am not talking about the summer school programs that are run by school districts for all the kids. That's not ESY, and that's not what the direct, directive from the state is about. 
As I reported last week, summer school programs are allowed to open on July 6th with many, many limitations. The Connecticut Department of Ed is going to be issuing some guidance on how to do that. We can expect to see that. And I'm not talking about day camps either. Day camps, I reported on last week, day camps are allowed to open on June 22nd, although if a camp is already open as of May 5th, it's allowed to stay open. And guidance on how to do that will come from the Office of Early Childhood. I'm talking about the guidance that was released on Wednesday of last week, May 20th, about ESY. There are three important takeaways from, from this guidance, and they're all good. Uh, basically, things that could uh, affect your child's right to ESY, they're unchanged. And parents, your right to ask for ESY or do something about it if you don't get it, that's unchanged too. The variable here is that school districts may not be able to pr provide ESY in the typical manner, according to the directive the State of Ed put, uh, the, the Department of Education put out. So what could affect ESY? According to the directive, state and local health restrictions, that could prevent a school from providing ESY. Also, the avail availability of personal protective equipment for teachers and staff. And also guidance from other state agencies, such as the Connecticut Department of Health. They have the power to make changes that can interfere with ESY. But it, ultimately, it's the pandemic that's going to control things. If the pandemic goes away over the summer, if things get better, then there's a greater chance that we'll be doing things in person in schools, in-person ESY, in-person summer school programs. And if things get worse, it's, it's possible to imagine that uh, everything will be done virtually. It's really up to the pandemic. So here are some scenarios that come out of the new directive that was issued by the state last week. If your child is eligible for extended school year, and I mean you've already had the PPT meeting, it was already agreed to, it's all signed off. According to the new directive, if your child is eligible for ESY, they should be given it to the greatest extent possible under the circumstances. Now, the plans for ESY should be written in a way, according to this directive, in a way as if schools were operating normally. So that's how it should be written up if ESY is granted. When determining eligibility for ESY, it's important to note that eligibility is based on the same criteria. Nothing has changed here. Regression, non-regression factors, they all need to be considered. And that's, that's the way it was before. When considering ESY, schools are asked to use data that was generated from the beginning of the school year this year all the way until the schools closed in March. Uh, by implication, that means that anything that happened after March and distance learning, I'm looking at you, is not going to be factored into the decision about providing ESY. That's the implication I'm taking away from it, folks. I might be wrong, but if there's something else to it, it eludes me. When determining eligibility for ESY, that data you're supposed to look at from the beginning of the school year up until March, that might not be available. And that's a very real thing. I went to a PPT meeting, a video conference, just last week where the team working from their homes while the school was closed did not have every last slip of paper that they should have had. Uh, we still moved ahead. It wasn't a big impediment but it does happen. Sometimes the data isn't available and you need to make a decision. So according to this directive from the state that came out last week on ESY, if the data isn't there, the decision on ESY should be made by teachers and staff who know the child working with parents and also using whatever information is available to them.
that's a common sense approach and it doesn't cut out parents and it's important not to cut out parents is it now if your child is not eligible for extended school year and you disagree with the decision your school should have already notified you with prior written notice that your request for ESY has been turned down. This would happen if you asked for it at a PPT meeting. The prior written notice would be provided on page three of your child's IEP. And also your school district should also provide you with additional information about how to exercise your due process rights and get things going. Why is this happening? Because folks, this is the way it was before. The pandemic hasn't changed this, hasn't changed due process rights. So many of the things, many of the rights that parents had, that students had, they, they, they still exist, all of them. They still exist, they're unchanged. It's just that the del del delivery of services may be interfered with by the pandemic. I liked this when I read the directive from the state. Regardless of ESY eligibility, school districts may provide educational opportunities or recovery services to students over the summer, students with disabilities. I like this because if ESY, summer camp, uh, summer school, if, if they're not going to happen, there still is the possibility that learning will continue over the summer for special education students. I like that. It also opens the door for some creative thinking by school people, creative ways to keep the learning going during summer for our kids. So that's something that we'll see, but school people, once again, we're depending on you to come up with this. When planning ESY, and I like this in the, in the, in the directive, uh, parents and students may have some current concerns themselves when it comes to safety, concerns about being in a bus, sharing a classroom with someone, and overall safety requirements. The state acknowledges this and has stated in the directive that there may be times for certain students where ESY becomes an experience that's a combination of in-person and virtual learning. So they have opened the door to that, and I think that's very respectful to parents and to students. So how does all this affect special education students? Well, parents now have more options than it first seemed in March. Back in March, it was doubtful that anything would happen over the summer. Now we have ESY, summer school, summer camp, and maybe more. It's good that parents have been assured that their rights and their child's rights are unchanged in this directive. That's important for everyone to understand. Just because we have a pandemic, it hasn't changed your rights or your child's rights. And as we look towards the future, there are some big hurdles to clear. For example, we almost crossed the hurdle of distance learning. <laughs> We're almost there. And then there's summer. That's another hurdle to clear. Follow, but followed by another big hurdle, back to school, hopefully in the fall. That will be a really big hurdle to cross. And we can expect lots of guidance to come out from the state and the feds on how to do that. But the highest hurl, hurdle to clear, however, involves doing the right thing for our children. It involves helping them make up for the learning that was lost and we already have some guidance on that from the Office of Special Education and Rehabilitative Services, which is part of the U.S. Department of Education. In their directive on March 21st, OSERS said that when schools start, IEP teams, PPT teams here in Connecticut, they will make an individualized determination about how far our children have regressed and to what extent compensatory services may be needed. This is a big promise and we're counting on school people to fulfill it. We are depending on you. All we have to do is wait for school to start. On the next answers on June 2nd, 
My guest will be Dr. Rabbit Stein, Director of Psychological and Behavioral Consultation Services for EastCon. Coming up is Dr. Joyce Rio, Assistant Director of Therapies for CREC. But first, school at home update with Audra Talbot. Earlier, Audra met with three students who are experiencing distance learning and she talked with them to get their views. Let's listen in. I have three guests with me tonight. Tyler, Sammy, and Emily. Welcome, and thank you for joining me tonight. So I'm going to do a quick introduction for each one of you, and then I'm gonna ask you some questions. And it's just like we're having a conversation, and it'll be fun. Tyler is a high school student. He's 16 years old, and he's in the 11th grade. Hi, Tyler. Hi. Sammy is a 23-year-old college student, and she works at a preschool. She's got a lot in her plate, and I also know that she loves to make jewelry. Hi, Sammy. Hello. Thanks for joining me tonight. And Emily. Emily is 20 years old. She's a junior in college. And thank you for joining me tonight, Emily. Good to see you. Hi. Tyler, I'm going to get started. Tyler, what does your school look like at home? First half of the day, we have our Google Meets. Um, they're usually about 45 minutes to 30 minutes each. Um, so mo Monday is periods one through five, and Tuesday is periods six through eight, and then uh, Thursday and Friday, the same thing. Wednesday, we don't have anything. Um, so first half of the day is doing the Google Meets. Second half, I usually do my work. Um, I'm usually done by around three, four um, o'clock. And that's my schedule ever since. That's a pretty long day sometimes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Do you like going to school at home? Um, I prefer actually physically going to school. Um, they've, they've assigned us a lot more work um, during quarantine. And it's a lot less personal. You're like asking for help. Um, it's kind of like a, like a degree of separation, I guess. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I agree with that. Uh, it's it's a, it's an isolating feeling, I think. Uh, do you feel that school's doing enough to keep your learning going? Um, yes, yeah, because when I've when I've asked for help and like set up separate meets with teachers, they've been willing and able to do it. Um, obviously on, on, on their end, it's harder to teach like a curriculum, like on a video. Um, so I guess so, but I'm, I'm not really a big fan of just overloading the work though. That's not really a good way to like teach at something. I know it's, I know it's, I know it's hard to like do this with the video chatting and all that, but it's not really, yeah. It's a different way of learning. Yeah. And, and I think in, in, from my perspective, because I'm a parent of two kids in special education, it's, it's um, one child is doing well because she likes to do that on her own, and my other child is really struggling. And yeah. It, and it, it, you're right. It is a tremendous amount of work. Um, okay, next question. How has the coronavirus pandemic affected your daily life? Daily life. So, um, I was I was sick for about two weeks. Um, it was it was most likely Corona. Um, I had to be. I was in my room for like sixteen days. Um, couldn't go downstairs. I uh, couldn't go outside, obviously. Um, so during those two weeks, I literally did nothing all day. Um, so that was that was not fun. Um, but after that, I've, 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 I think I've adapted pretty well. Um, I have school, so that takes up most of my day. Um, I've, I've found ways to like do the stuff I want. I found time. Um, yeah. Well, I'm sorry you had to be isolated yeah. for, for 16 days. 
I give you a lot of credit because I don't know. I, I mean, you did it because you had to. But yes. It's just the thought of having to do that. I do have a friend that did that as well. And um, it wasn't fun. So yeah. I'm sorry. What advice would you give to parents in helping their child? Be a little more, um, be a little more like lenient, I guess. Um, sometimes, because obviously kids don't have school, so um, I know, I know, it's definitely taxing on the parents. Like with my younger sister, it's definitely taxing on my mom. She's not in daycare, um, and because of that, my mom's temper has become shorter. Um, so try to just push through that and become a little more lenient and more understanding, um, but yeah. Yeah, well, I take that to heart because I feel as though I've, I started off a certain way, very gung-ho, yeah. we're gonna do this kind of thing, and I've eased up a lot because we're going into week 10 here in my house, and I, yeah. I, I also, um, my fuse did get a little bit shorter in the beginning in the middle up to yeah. now. So I thank you for saying that because it kind of puts puts me back in check to hear it from you. So thank you for sharing that. How are you handling your doctor appointments? So um, a bunch of them were canceled. Like before before this, I had like a dermatology and a eyeglass appointment scheduled and a dentist checkup. Um, those were all uh, canceled. Um, when I was sick, I had one like video conference telehealth thing with my um, pediatrician um, for about like 10 minutes. I just told her what I was feeling. And then after that, it was my mom that was updating the, pre the uh, pediatrician like remotely, mm -hmm. I guess via email. Um, but I haven't had any appointments like besides that one. They, okay. They've all been canceled and haven't been rescheduled. Yeah. Okay. How do you stay connected with friends? Texting, social media. Uh, we kind of see each other during the um, online classes, so yeah. Well, that's all good. It's yeah. it's it's and and that's what I think brings us together. Yes. Yeah. The Zoom meetings and the, yeah. the Google Hangouts and and even just old school, which I am. <laughs> I'm showing my age, but you know, talking on the phone. It's just, you know, pick up the phone and just have a, a five minute conversation. So, yeah, that's what I do. But I'm glad you're seeing connected, Tyler. Yeah. Thank you. Sammy, what does a school day look like for you? My school day is very busy, and I have a lot of assignments to do each week. It seems like I had a lot more work than when I was in school, than when I was out of school. And one of my professors was giving us a lot of work because our original class was three hours long. That's a long class. It is. Yeah, I, I don't miss that from college. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. But it, so it definitely feels like there's more work being definitely. homeschool. Yeah, I get that too in, in my class. There were a couple of weeks where I had like five assignments to do in one week. That is in one class and then two more in the other class. Do you like going to school at home? Um, at first I wasn't sure and it was very stressful at the beginning. But once I got used to it, I liked it. But I would prefer to be in class because I miss seeing everyone and it's harder to ask for help when I need it. And I can't directly ask the teacher after email them the questions. So quick question, Tammy. How has the coronavirus pandemic affected your daily life? By having class at home and and work I have three guests with me tonight, Tyler, Sammy, and Emily. Welcome, and thank you for joining me tonight. 
So I'm going to do a quick introduction for each one of you, and then I'm going to ask you some questions. And it's just like we're having a conversation, and it'll be fun. Tyler is a high school student. He's 16 years old, and he's in the 11th grade. Hi, Tyler. Hi. Sammy is a 23-year-old college student, and she works at a preschool. She's got a lot in her plate, and I also know that she loves to make jewelry. Hi, Sammy. Hello. Thanks for joining me tonight. And Emily, Emily is 20 years old. She's a junior in college. And thank you for joining me tonight, Emily. Good to see you. Hi. Um. Tyler, I'm gonna get started. Tyler, what does your school look like at home? First half of the day, we have our Google Meets. Um, they're usually about 45 minutes to 30 minutes each. Um, so mo Monday is periods one through five, and Tuesday is period six through eight, and then uh, Thursday and Friday, the same thing. Wednesday, we don't have anything. Um, so first half of the day is doing the Google Meets. Second half, I usually do my work. Um, I'm usually done by around three, four um, o'clock, and that's my schedule ever since. That's a pretty long day sometimes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Do you like going to school at home? Um, I prefer actually physically going to school. Um, they've, they've assigned us a lot more work um, during quarantine, and it's a lot less personal. You're, like, asking for help. Um, it's kind of like a, in a degree of separation, I guess. That's a great way to put it. I agree with that. Uh, it's it's a, it's an isolating feeling, I think. Uh, do you feel that school is doing enough to keep your learning going? Um. Yes. Yeah. Because when I've when I've asked for help and like set up separate meets with teachers, they've been willing and able to do it. Um. Obviously, on 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 their end, it's harder to teach like a curriculum like on a video um so i guess so but I, I'm, I'm not really a big fan of just overloading the work though that's not really a good way to like teach at something i know it's i know it's i know it's hard to like do this with the video chatting and all that but it's not really yeah it's a different way of learning yeah and I think in, in, from my perspective, because I'm a parent of two kids in special education, it's, it's um, one child is doing well because she likes to do that on her own. And my other child is really struggling. And yeah. in, it, it, you're right. It is a tremendous amount of work. Um, okay. Next question. How has the coronavirus pandemic affected your daily life? Daily life. So, um... I was I was sick for about two weeks. Um, it was it was most likely Corona. Um, I had to be. I was in my room for like sixteen days. Um, couldn't go downstairs. I uh, couldn't go outside, obviously. Um, so during those two weeks, I literally did nothing all day. Um, so that was that was not fun. Um, but after that. I've, I've, I, th I think I've adapted pretty well. Um, I have school, so that takes up most of my day. Um, I've, I've found ways to like do the stuff I want. I found time. Um, yeah. Well, I'm sorry you had to be isolated yeah. for, for 16 days. I give you a lot of credit because I don't know. I, I mean, you did it because you had to. But yeah. it's, it's just the thought of having to do that. I do have a friend that did that as well. And um, it wasn't fun. So yeah. I'm sorry. What advice would you give to parents in helping their child? Be a little more, um, be a little more like lenient, I guess. Um, sometimes. Because obviously kids don't have school. So um, I know I know. I, it's definitely taxing on the parents. Like with my younger sister, if 
definitely taxing on my mom. She's not in daycare. Um, and because of that, my mom's temper has become shorter. Um, so try to just push through that and become a little more lenient and more understanding. Um, but yeah. Yeah. But, well, I take that to heart because I feel as though I've, I started off a certain way, very gung ho. We're going to do this kind of thing. And I've eased up a lot because we're going into we 10 here in my house. And I, yeah. I, I also, um, my fuse did get a little bit shorter in the beginning in the middle. <coughs> yeah. now. So I thank you for saying that because it kind of puts, puts me back in check to hear it from you. So thank you for sharing that. How are you handling your doctor appointments? So um, a bunch of them were canceled. Like before, before this, I had like a dermatology and a eyeglass appointment scheduled and a dentist checkup. Um, those were all uh, canceled. Um, when I was sick, I had one like video conference telehealth thing with my um, pediatrician um, for about like 10 minutes. I just told her what I was feeling. And then after that, it was my mom that was updating the, pre the uh, pediatrician like remotely via mm -hmm. email. Um, but I haven't had any appointments like besides that one. They, okay. They've all been canceled and haven't been rescheduled. Yeah. Okay. How do you stay connected with friends? Texting, social media. Uh, we kind of see each other during the um, online classes, so, yeah. Well, that's all good. It's, yeah. it's, it's, and, and that's what I think brings us together. Yes. Yeah. The Zoom meetings and the, yeah. the Google Hangouts and, and even just old school, which I am. <laughs> I'm showing my age, but, you know, talking on the phone. It's just, you know, pick up the phone and just have a, a five-minute conversation. So, yeah, that's what I do. But I'm glad you're seeing connected, Tyler. Yeah. Thank you. Sammy, what does a school day look like for you? My school day is very busy, and I have a lot of assignments to do each week. It seems like I had a lot more work than when I was in school, than when I was out of school. And one of my professors was giving us a lot of work because our original class was three hours long. That's a long class. It is. Yeah, I, I don't miss that from college. <laughs> <laughs> I understand, but it so it definitely feels like there's more work being definitely. homeschool. Yeah, I get that too. In, in my yes. house, there were a couple of weeks where I had like five assignments to do in one week, that is in cool. one class, and then two more in the other class. Do you like going to school at home? Um. At first, I wasn't sure, and it was very stressful at the beginning, but once I got used to it, I liked it, but I would prefer to be in class because I miss seeing everyone, and it's harder to ask for help when I need it, and I can't directly ask the teacher after email them the questions. So, quick question, Tammy. How has the coronavirus pandemic affected your daily life? By having class at home and and work temporarily closed in March, and we haven't been open yet, but we're opening back in June. But for most of the time, we didn't know when we were going to open again, and I missed all my all my students too. But um, it's helped a lot because we have a Zoom meeting once a week with everyone and all the children, so we can still get to see them once a week. Sammy, so that's the preschool that you work at as well? Yes. Yeah. So it's nice It's nice that you get to Zoom and see the children. It is, yeah. Do you feel your school is doing enough to keep your learning going? Yes, I do. My professors are very quick to respond to the emails or questions I had. And one of my professors gave us all her phone number so we could text her of any questions and she could get back to us faster. 
or we could text her if we need her device on something. And the tutoring center, the ACES center of the college, switched to online, which was good because they used a lot, especially when I'm doing my birthdays. Wow, that's and really good. And we did a virtual class with one of my professors once a week. That's good that you, they switched the online tutoring. Yeah. Yeah. That was really good. That really helped. Sammy, what advice would you give parents in helping their child? Um, the advice I would give is to do fun things at home, like projects or games, so they won't get bored, and to help them stay connected to friends, and maybe have a virtual play date, and have them take breaks from doing schoolwork once in a while, so they don't get overwhelmed, because it could be very overwhelming. I really like that you said taking a break, because I have to have my kids take a break in between every single lesson. But what's good about that is I get to take a break. <laughs> my mom always told me to take a break too when I was doing school work. Yeah, it's important. We need a brain break. Yeah. Yeah. And Sammy, how do you stay connected with your friends? I stay connected by te texting them, and we have Zoom meetings with CASA. And then we have to work Zoom meetings. That's wonderful. So pretty much technology is how we're all staying connected and you're yes. accessing that yes that's great thank you thank you sammy you're welcome hi emily um what is your school day like at home since i'm in college my school year is over but i did the distance learning for about two months it definitely wasn't easy. I typically have to sit on the floor in order to use my computer and my iPad. So, oftentimes I would be on the floor for hours doing schoolwork. Do you feel your school was doing enough to keep learning going? I feel like Sacred Heart is doing enough. But some of my professors didn't participate in the virtual class meetings and just send us work to do every week, which really isn't the way students should be learning, especially when it's higher education. I agree with you, Emily. I think that the participation should be equal for <laughs> teachers and students. <laughs> How has coronavirus pandemic affected your daily life? The pandemic definitely affected my life as far as school, but my life isn't really much different. I was never really the type of person who needed to go out every day, so I'm perfectly content at home. I go walking in my walker out by pretty much every day now, so that's good enough for me. I like that perspective, Emily. I'm kind of the same way. I'm a homebody. <laughs> what advice would you give to parents in helping their child? My advice for parents in helping their child during this time would be to have as much patience as possible. This is a difficult time for children not being in school, and they're really missing out on that physical interaction that they're used to, and I think it's important for parents to understand. I absolutely agree with you. I think that patience is the number one thing that I need to practice at home. I do my best. The accommodations that they give you through telehealth, I'm guessing that you're able to access the accommodations, but you can't access the actual physical therapy is what you need, the hands-on. Yeah. Yeah. So... So the coronavirus pandemic has impacted you so much that you can't access your medically necessary physical therapy in order to help you. So that's pretty significant. Yeah. <laughs> How do you stay connected with friends? 
I stay connected with my friends by texting them. Yeah, we all are, Emily. I think that it's our lifeline to kind of the outside world. All our technology and texting and Zoom meetings. It's yeah. what makes us human is to stay connected. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for joining us for Answers from PATH, Parent to Parent Family Voices of Connecticut. I'm Audra Talbot. And I want to thank my very special guests tonight, Tyler, Sammy, and Emily. I think it's wonderful how you share your perspective. And I think as parents, myself speaking, it gives me a whole different perspective on how I should be approaching everything with my children. So thank you. And that's all for tonight. See you next thank week. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Audra. That was an interesting report. <clears throat> you know, when the decision was made that we would interview students who are experienced with distance learning, we wanted to get students who were, were articulate, who had their act together, and we really didn't have to look very far. The three young people that you just saw are all involved with CT CASA. That's where we found them. This is one more reason why CT CASA is worth checking out. Now is my interview with Joyce Rio, Assistant Director of Therapies at the Capital Region Education Council. Joyce, I hope you're there and there you are, <laughs> hi. I am, how are you, Kevin? I'm good, thank you so much for appearing on Answers. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a bunch of questions for you, a bunch of very specific questions, but for starters, I, I wonder if we could just go with a very general question. Uh, what is the role of the occupational therapist in special education and in public education? Perfect. Um, so actually, before before I begin that, I almost want to back up. You know, you had done a, a disclaimer at the beginning of the show, and, and I feel as though I almost need to do my own little disclaimer, um, saying that clearly I'm not sharing legal advice, and I am not here representing Kreck's opinion. Um, a lot of what I will talk about today is kind of data that, data that I've gathered, stories that I've heard from the field, and things like that. So that's what I'll be emphasizing. Um, so back to your question about the role of occupational therapists in special education. Um, occupational therapy uh, at, at times is very misunderstood, and it is, I, I think, in part because we use occupation in a very broad sense. Um, so I do want to break that down a little bit, um, you know, and really look at the word occupy. How do you occupy your day? And uh, occupational therapists really focus on creating those, creating and, and facilitating opportunities um, for people to engage in occupations. And for students, those occupations are learning, socializing, taking care of themselves, their belongings, um, and ultimately preparing them for adulthood. So that is uh, what we do. And in special education, we are a related service. Um, and based on, you know, does the child need occupational therapy to benefit from special education? Um, all focused on services that emphasize their participation in school and learning activities. I see. Thank you. <laughs> now, at, at this time of distance learning, what are the methods that occupational therapists use to support their students? Yes, this has been quite the evolving process. You know, at one point we were in our building and then, you know, the, over the weekend, that, that was it. We moved into advanced lear or distance learning. Um, so all of us are learning new ways of doing things and being creative, um, getting up to speed with all the technology tools. 
I happen to facilitate a statewide um, OT community of practice. And ever since we went into um, the distance learning, we have been holding um, weekly meetings across the state um, just to share resources, kind of navigate the terrain that um, was in front of us and really explore uh, telehealth, what, what it's all about and how we can best offer services. Um, so I'm sure everybody has already heard about synchronous services under telehealth, those live interactive sessions, um, and also asynchronous, anything that we are kind of storing and forwarding. Um, so that has been our big emphasis. And when we meet for our communities of practice, uh, we have uh, people share out case studies, you know, to really showcase what is being done so we can learn from one another and, and be better at this. Um, and what we've discovered with the synchronous sessions is really those first sessions are about just reconnecting with the students, focusing on building relationships. Um, these are times where the students have to I want to share like, oh, this is my house. These are my things. This is what I'm doing. Um, and that social connection is just so important to begin um, the process. And then we discover that really that second session ends up being about setting up the learning environment and moving forward. We've discovered that really establishing routines, having some consistency within sessions, that has worked out quite nicely. And we all know that having structure and routines are just so critical during uncertain times. It brings us a source of comfort. Um, therapists have also been doing uh, co-serve sessions, you know, joining together the OT and the PT, or possibly the teacher and the OT providing um, joint sessions with a student or uh, small group activities. Um, and through that process, really trying to figure out, you know, what common materials uh, do people already have in the home that could be used for activities. Um, my therapists that have been doing the co-serve sessions or have found that um, sending out a pre-teach video to families helps them understand or uh, kind of what will happen during the session and, and families have been very grateful for those videos. Um, you know, once the session is held, it, it seems like everybody is on the same page and things go a bit smoother. Um, and then, uh, you know, providing some follow-up reflections. Um, you know, here's a picture of me hanging up our project at home, just to kind of connect and, and close the loop for students. You know, it's not just the session during that, that one sitting. It extends beyond um, students that really need more supports. Uh, we've been so grateful for families really stepping in and kind of being our e-helper or our hands-on. And um, we found that this has worked out quite well. Um, we've, we've heard some really positive um, comments from families because now all of a sudden as therapy practitioners, we need to break down our professional reasoning and communicate that in a way that the person on the other side is understanding um, what, what we're, we're asking. Um, so, you know, families are, are getting some new um, insights and, and hopefully walking away with some nice aha moments and ways of thinking of doing things and, and realizing that maybe some things are just uh, very simple um, and can result in you know, what you want to achieve. Um, for those students that struggle with interactive sessions, you know, we have been moving into more of a coaching model. Um, that seems to work out well. Um, or even consulting with families and, um, you know, not putting a lot of pressure, but finding out, you know, how can we best support you? Um, looking at very basics to start, not putting a, a lot of pressure on people, um, but looking at, you know, our basic needs being met within the home for, for sleeping, um, mealtime routines, um, you know, access to food, getting water in the day, you know, our routines have been so disrupted. Um, so sometimes it's just very critical to start at those basic levels and even looking at emotional well-being. Um, so listening, letting people know that we're all in this together, um, those sorts of things. 
And then the asynchronous activities, those store and forward, again, going back to those recorded videos, we've, we've heard some positive things from families um, when they've received those short video clips um, that the, the students are interested in looking at them. It's a quick and easy way to provide information versus everything in written form. Um, so uh, we've been doing more and more videos. I do have a staff member that has been do it, was doing um, pound fit classes when we were in the building. And um, she has actually done some recorded videos for the students to continue the pound fit classes at home. And that has been very well received. Um, so trying to find things that are, are simple, easy, um, and, you know, hopefully providing virtual materials that are going to uh, benefit everybody. That was a long answer. <laughs> oh, yes, but very factual. I, I like There's that. a lot going on. <laughs> there is, there is. And OTs have, have, have had to face a lot of challenges at this time of distance learning. What do you think are some of the greatest challenges that <laughs> Yeah, uh, th that's a good question because, uh, you know, initially our biggest challenges are technology. We're typically hands-on people. Um, and not everybody is technologically savvy. So during our uh, weekly communities of practice, we actually host like uh, tech tips um, so that we are doing some brief little segments on training on how to use different uh, technology tools, um, you know, technology tools that will help with our sessions, even how to manage our files. You know, everything is electronic right now. So when we find materials and resources, you know, how do we store them so we can find them quick and easy in the future? And how can we work smarter through this process? Um, but supporting one another, figuring out what works, um, that those sorts of things um, have, have certainly allowed us to um, get over some of the, the learning curve of how to navigate technology. And our, our second challenge um, is really how to connect with families and students that are just overwhelmed um, and, and maybe just are not available to engage at this point in time. Um, we've had a lot of conversations at our community of practice around, you know, how do we find those small steps? How do we begin to um, build connections, meet families where they're at? Um, we have had a lot of conversations around asking families from a, a strengths-based perspective, you know, what is working, looking at some of the positives versus always looking at, you know, what isn't working. Sometimes when you look at the positives, um, it does provide a little brightness and there's a little bit more energy associated with it so you can get through things. Um, even assisting families with um, kind of time and energy audits and, you know, the, the segment just prior to this when interviewing the students, you know, everybody needs a movement break and we need to give ourselves permission to step away from the computer and technology to get that break so we can um, build up our energy and um, yeah, uh, just th those are probably our greatest challenges, but we are a group that it always looks at, all right, what can we do? Sure. And of, of course, you, you have a partner in all this, the partner on the other side of the screen, the parent. Uh, usually that parent's name is mom, but there are exceptions. Um, what can parents do at home to help? Let's say they have a child who has OT goals and objectives in their uh, IEP. What can a parent do to help to back up the good work that OTs do? Or, or at least try to do through distance learning? What can parents do at home? Yeah, so, you know, uh, obviously if OT is a service provider on the IEP, let us know how we can support you. Um, that's, that's at the very uh, basic level. Um, and if they are ready to look at goals and objectives, then sit down and look at those together collaboratively and determine, you know, can these be translated into the new learning environment? Um, can it even be embedded in natural family routines already instead of adding this extra burden onto everyone's day? Um, you know, there's times where kids need direct practice for certain things like handwriting and keyboarding. 
um, you know, the direct practice time might might need to be carved out of the day, but there are certainly other things, natural routines, you know, our kiddos with uh, self-help goals and objectives, mealtime skills, you know, how can we begin to translate those um, those areas or interventions and strategies that were used within the natural uh, routine? Um, and is it something that can be added to a schedule as far as like movement breaks and exercise. So we are promoting some healthy living through all of this craziness. Sure. Now I know parents who are doing that kind of thing at home. Yep. I know parents who their children are having some success too, uh, with distance learning, learning, not just with OT, but academically, uh, depending on the child, if they're suited for it, they, they can do very well. Um, on, on the other end of the spectrum, there are parents who are very frustrated because they have a child or children who are, are not engaged in distance learning. Quite often, it's behavioral, maybe connected to whatever made them eligible for special education in the first place. Um, it's highly frustrating for, for, for the parent and also, also for the, the child. It, it affects the whole family, really. Uh, what advice would you give to a parent who feels their child isn't engaging with distance learning? Yeah, if, first of all, start with your own health. You know, make sure you're taking care of yourself. And uh, you know, if you if 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 you're not healthy and um, you know in, in a good place, it it can be challenging. This it's overwhelming and daunting. Um, so certainly starting there with yourself, and then you know, looking for little mini wins. It doesn't have to be, you know, three hours or a half an hour. You know, it could be one minute of, of success and begin to celebrate those little mini wins. It's, it's important to do that. Um, you know, schedules and routines. If, if there's a way to build some consistency within the day, um, certainly try to, to capitalize on that because it does bring a source of comfort for everyone. And um, looking at, at the students' strengths, we all have inherent strengths. So, you know, what are they good at and how can you build upon that? Um, draw upon your team. It, it does, you know, most likely make you, put you in a, maybe a, a feeling of vulnerability and, and um, being scared, but we are all in this together. And, you know, we really, are very focused on trying to support um, our students. Um, so, yeah, try, trying to trying to navigate it together. Um, know that you are not alone. And I think that's an important part of it. Knowing that you're not alone. A anyone who's suffering or going through a hard time uh, finds a lot of solace in, in that. So that's that that that's some good advice. Now, let's talk about evaluations for a second, because mm -hmm. OTs do evaluations, uh, related service providers, teachers, school psychologists. Uh, by the time schools reopen, school people will be faced with a mountain of missed evaluations. How are they going to handle it? Could assessment by video conference be part of the solution? What do you think? Yeah, so that, that's a huge fear. Uh, as far as, as you know, returning to our buildings and having uh, a, a mountain of evaluations that will be very difficult to manage. You know, where where do you put your time and energy when you do get back into the building? Um, not to say that we have to push all evaluations aside, but in some way we do have to focus on where are the essential and critical needs. Um, so that's that's just a, a, a thought. You know, how do we do that? Um, there have been some uh, brief discussions within our community of practice around, you know, what is the purpose of the evaluation? Is it to determine the, the initial evaluation to determine if a child is a child with an educational disability, you know, requires specialized instruction and related services? Um, you know, when is the time to do those evaluations? I mean, obviously, we will have a timeline based on referral. Um, but some of the, the concern, I think, that um, is in the back of our minds, will there be um, false positives if we evaluate too soon? Um, because we are most likely under the, the situation of the COVID slide, you know, and um, 
what are the recommendations going to be following evaluations? It's going to require a lot of um, conversation and thought and collaborative efforts um, with everyone, parents included, on how to best meet students' needs um, when we return into the building. Um, so back to your, your thought or comment about uh, remote evaluations, you know, there are um, some companies that do provide assessments for virtual administration. Um, you know, are those tests what we would need to administer to really help inform us on what our needs are? Um, do we have therapists that are well trained in those things and, and all of that to make sure that they are administered with fidelity? Um, and yeah, lots and lots of questions around evaluations. <laughs> and sure. no answers. Sure. Well, it, it, all you have to do is watch this webinar sooner or later. You, you'll get the answers. Yeah, good. <laughs> Let's talk about compensatory services for a second. You, you heard me read the directive from OSERS saying that if necessary, our children will be, compensatory, be given compensatory services. Can we talk about that for a minute? Yeah, most definitely. It was interesting, uh, Kevin, because I, I don't recall, um, I, I, I don't know if I've seen that document or, or the compensatory services phrase really has not stood out in my mind because I know there have been some conversations around compensatory services because there, there is a working or an operational definition for determining when compensatory services are due. And usually it's around when somebody has done something wrong. And clearly under our current conditions, everybody is putting their best efforts um, possible to ensure continued learning. Um, so I, I don't know if at some point there will be a different term that is kind of rolled out to better describe the service needs for those individuals that maybe have slipped back to and need additional supportive uh, learning during this time. And I'm just hopeful that, you know, we will be using the best evidence available and really data to guide decisions um, in moving forward. You know, doubling up on therapy or services can actually work in reverse. Um, more, you know, is, is not always better. And, you know, in many ways, that that thinking confuses quantity with value. And we want to make sure that we are pushing out value versus, you know, just um, dumping a, a large number of services on a child, making things more challenging and, and working in reverse. Um, so, you know, anytime we, we double up on services, you know, it could potentially interfere with participation in other school activities. So it's, it's a constant uh, conversation around, you know, what, what are the child's needs? How do we, how do we move forward and, and make the best decisions in the best interest of the child? Well, it, it is pretty well known in the business of special education that simply doubling the amount of service a student gets does not double the progress that they make. Our kids are humans, they're, they're, they're not machines. And there are so many limitations, just the length of the school day, the length of the school year. This is going to be something that needs to be figured out, um, but it's, it, it's definitely something that will, will, will have to be hatched out considering how many kids have regressed. Something will need to be done about that. Exactly. Uh, if, if compensatory services are, are, are needed for special education students who have regressed, uh, uh, how do you think that they will be delivered? I, I, I don't even know. <laughs> Um, it, you know, probably what we've done in the past, um, we would draw upon that. Um, compensatory services, if, if someone needs it, it, it usually is a additional service time. But, but again, you know, I, I go back and just wonder, is that the best way to provide services? Yeah, that, that's a very simple solution for a very complex situation. Yep. Uh, let, let's change gears and talk about safety precautions. Everyone's looking forward at 
the new school year coming up, hopefully in the fall, and the schools are reopened. There will be all kinds of safety precautions. If you look at schools in the two states that are allowing schools to open and overseas, there are a lot of a lot of things that I think it's safe to expect we, we can see here. Students wearing masks, uh, social distancing, pool noodles, six foot pool noodles being used mm -hmm. to enforce that. A uh, lot of cleaning, cleansing, uh, sanitizing, that kind of thing. Um, how can schools comply with these new safety precautions for students and teachers in buildings that were really not designed for them. The commissioner uh, of the State Department of Education he, he, he even mentioned that our, our, our school buildings were actually built for the opposite, <clears throat> learning together in groups. So I know I'm asking you to look into a crystal ball here, but what do you think? What kind of steps are going to be taken? Exactly. So there, there certainly have been many uh, conversations around this issue and task forces that have been formed to explore the complexity of returning to our skill buildings and, and how to do it safely. Um, you know, we are drawing upon the guidance of you, you had already uh, shown the document that Connecticut has released around a reopened Connecticut, which does include um, schools considerations, but looking at other uh, guidance from the CDC, Johns Hopkins, um, American Enterprise Institute. So there's, there's a number of um, subject matter experts or, or organizations that are, are pulling in subject matter experts to put guidance together um, as schools in other countries and uh, across the nation, I, I think all eyes are going to be on them as well. You know, what are they doing? What is working? Um, as occupational therapy practitioners, you know, we've begun to even um, pre-plan and prepare our students for a new normal. Um, you know, doing some social stories, doing modeling, uh, education on wearing a mask, um, wearing a mask while eating and drinking. You know, what do you do with your mask and when do you return it? What are the rules around mask wear? Um, personal space, you had mentioned the pool noodles um, spacing. They are a genius in their size and they seem to work out well as a, a physical reminder for personal space. Um, even, you know, staying in your taped off area, we've seen that in other um, schools, hand washing, hand washing has been a big focus for uh, training and um, things like that. Um, beginning to close the lid on the toilet when flushing, it seems kind of silly, but that is, that is some of the guidance so that, you know, air particles are not dispersed um, throughout the air. Um, storing your personal supplies in your own bin, kind of following some very simple rules and regimens, um, managing eye fatigue for those that are still doing distance learning and on uh, computers quite a bit, uh, you know, kind of doing the eye yoga. And then, um, you know, how do you build in need for movement uh, within a small, small space? So creatively looking at some of those things. I'm sure those are all factors that are going to affect school people in every school building in the country. Uh, talking about mm -hmm. OTs specifically, though, uh, what kind of difficulties will OTs run into when trying to deliver their service in person? Yeah, so most most occupational therapy practitioners um, are itinerant, meaning we're traveling from school building to school building, um, site to site, classroom to classroom. Um, so that clearly is going to offer a challenge. You know, if we are moving into classrooms, then that changes the numbers for how many people can be in there. Um, we have started to talk about, you know, is there a possibility to become part of the cohort on, on one day? So, you know, if there's a classroom that is supposed to remain together all day long, you know, can you, can you provide your services in that classroom on that specific day? And then, you know, another classroom that may very well work out well for our schools that have, um, students with, um, with special needs and, and high demand for OT services. 
um, but our typical public schools where, you know, we, we may have one child in one classroom and three children in another classroom, that philosophy is not going to work. So will we be doing some kind of a hybrid option when we return to school and um, doing technology and having e-helpers in the classroom um, help administer some of our, our strategies and interventions, very similar to how we're doing with families uh, right now. Um, the other thing to uh, think about is, it, and um, initial conversation is, you know, what about homebound services for those uh, students that really are medically fragile and um, might not be ready to come back to school? And are those numbers going to increase um, as a result? And, you know, how do we respond to that so we're meeting uh, students' needs? Um, so looking at all the different angles, but realizing that, you know, we have a new normal right now. This is no longer, um, we're not going to be using technology and we're going to go back to the old way of doing things. Most likely we're going to have a real combined um, way of doing things and, and learning forward. I agree. I agree. Uh, let's, let's take a, a question that has come in. When schools open, Will the demand for occupational therapists increase? And will that cause a shortage of occupational therapists in Connecticut? What do you think about that? Uh, you know, it, who knows? I, I, I've wondered this as well, because if we have um, a, a increased demand for evaluations, do we need occupational therapists just to be assigned to evaluations where um, other therapy practitioners are assigned to intervention to make sure that those services are being implemented. Um, so there, there certainly could be. And, you know, occupational therapists, we are a very uh, diverse um, group. And, you know, we do um, focus on um, health and wellness overall, physical, mental, and, and cognitive health and wellness. So we could, could potentially have our hands in a number of pots when we return. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, if, if that means a shortage of OT services, then that's a, another factor that will have to be considered when the schools reopen and we're trying to get by, clear that hurdle. <laughs> yep. Here's another question. When schools reopen and special education students are looked at for regression, I, th I think the writer is asking uh, what methods uh, will be used to measure just if they have regressed and how far they have regressed. How do you think that will work out? Exactly. So I, I'm making an assumption that we will be using the um, data that we have when we were in the building and, you know, collecting data when we return in the building to to examine, you know, ha has the student regressed and then, you know, providing services and, and seeing if, you know, doing some progress monitoring to see if they are on track for for recovery or um, or not. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, we have time for one more question, and, and this time the question comes from me. What do you think? Is this a good time to be an OT? It's so challenging, and I suppose <laughs> that, that this could apply to other school people, professionals, uh, related service providers. Once the schools reopen, well, I'm not going to use the word madhouse because school people don't usually let it get that <laughs> get that far. Um, but it's going to be so complicated. And just like with distance learning, in some ways, it's going to be on the job training. Is this a good time to be in OT or is it a better time to find another field? Every time is a good time to be an OT. <laughs> so I, I'm a bit of an OT cheerleader. So, um, you know, I, I love my profession. And, and quite honestly, during this whole, whole process, I have loved hearing the amazing stories that are happening. And, 
you know, families have reported so many lovely successes and, and we've made connections with families that we probably did not um, fully have when we were in the building. But now because we are, we're essentially in their homes um, and they are an active part of this process. And it just feels like we are at a point where we are truly embracing the heart of IDEA, everybody working together and um, addressing the essential skills and needs. So, you know, as an occupational therapist, um, being able to promote that and support that is an exciting place to be. You know, I, I agree with you, uh, especially about that part, uh, everyone understanding each other better. I, I think this experience, if you're looking for, you know, positive things that come out of it, I think parents are getting a much better appreciation of what teachers and school staff do. I think teachers and school staff are getting to see just how de dedicated parents are to their children. This can only increase mm -hmm. the bond yep. between school and home. And as I'm known to say, when the bond between school and home is, is strong, some really great things can happen. So Janet, thank you for okay. joining, joining me for this edition of Answers. Um, thanks to Audra and to our three young people who we interviewed. Thank you, Emily, Sammy, and Tyler. I really appreciate it. And thank you to you all for, for joining us. Please join us next week, June 2nd at 6 p.m. for the next edi edition of Answers. Until then, be well. Thank you.